Amen. What a gift it is to be prayed over. And to be in partnership with so many people around the world. Church, I invite you to take out your Bibles and open up to Amos chapter 6. <clears throat> now, if you are new to People's Church, maybe this is your first Sunday. We've been going through this series. We're six sermons through already. So if you haven't heard of an Amos sermon yet, we're taking a unique approach as we step into this book. We are looking at Old Testament history, what was happening in the time of Amos, but then we're stepping out of the book, looking into the period of colonization and church history and some of the lasting legacies of that period that we're living into today. Now, each week built upon the previous week's knowledge. So if this is your first sermon, you have six sermons to catch up on because the information shared builds on uh, each chapter. Now, in chapter five, Amos uh, opens with a lament. He's lamenting the condition of the northern tribes. Injustice is pervasive. It's woven into the system. It's been systematized into the courts, into the tax laws. They are casting righteousness to the ground and turning justice into bitterness. They're condemning the innocent poor. They're building wealth off the backs of oppression. And he's warning the northern tribes that they've actually wandered away from the worship of Yahweh into false gods and idolatry. True worship of God should always look like justice, righteousness, and loving your neighbor. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at the conclusion of chapter five, and some of the people were looking forward to the day of the Lord. They were thinking to themselves that they were gonna be okay because they're going through the motions of worship. And Amos leans into that group. But then, as he turns to chapter six, he addresses those who show indifference to his message, those who meet it with apathy. And look at what Amos says to them in verse one. <clears throat> Woe to you who are complacent in Zion, and to you who feel secure on Mount Samaria, you notable men of the foremost nation to whom the people of Israel come. Amos broadens his message to encompass the whole nation. He's speaking about Jerusalem and Samaria, and he's speaking to their pride their haughtiness, they feel secure in their little mountain fortress. They believe that their being chosen means that they're above or better than the nations around them. And Amos is written during a time of national abundance and military conquest. And so they feel secure. They don't believe that God is sending a warning through Amos. They don't believe that harm will come to them in their fortress mountain. And so he reminds them that you're not even that great. Your confidence is misplaced. Your security is ill-founded. And he uses the surrounding nations to deliver that message. Look at what he says in verse 2. Go to Kalna and look at it. Go from there to the great Hamath and then go down to Gath and Philistine. Are they better off than your two kingdoms? Is their land larger than yours? You put off the day of disaster and bring near a reign of terror. Their false sense of security is actually making things worse. Their thought that they are the chosen ones and therefore nothing bad can happen is actually misguided thinking. In fact, it's according to God's law that this is going to happen. In Leviticus 26, long before they entered the promised land, God warned them about the high cost of tuning out his voice, of digging in against him. I would encourage you to read Leviticus 26 this week. It has a lot to speak to what's happening during the time of Amos. But there's a repeated statement in Leviticus 26 that I want to draw our attention to. It's the importance of listening to his voice. Look at what it says. But if you will not listen to me, and then he goes on to describe some judgments. If after all this, you will not listen to me, he describes escalating more judgments. If you remain hostile towards me and refuse to listen to me, 
Then God details and outlines more judgments. If in spite of these things, you do not accept my correction, but continue to be hostile towards me, he details more. And then in verse 27, if in spite of this, you still do not listen to me, but continue to be hostile towards me, and he goes on to outline more judgments. Five times in Leviticus 26, five times in 13 verses, God warns about the escalating nature of failing to listen to him. God knows what it's like to be a parent. Amen? Like, five times he repeats his statement, if you don't listen to me, if you don't listen to me. Disobedience isn't a neutral position. It will actually lead you to a place where you are actually hostile towards God. When we let sin get a foothold in our lives, it grows. It has an anesthetizing effect on our conscience. It makes us feel comfortable with its presence, and then it starts to take over, eventually causing you to tune out to the voice of the Spirit in your life. But then Amos tells us what's anesthetizing them. Look at what's making them complacent. You lie on beds adorned with ivory and lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and fattened calves. You strum away on your harps like David and improvise on musical instruments. You drink wine by the bowlful and use the finest lotions, but you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph." They're living the high life. It's their abundance and materialism that's getting in the way of them hearing from God. They're too busy picking out the new furniture or planning the next fattened calf they're going to eat or the endless entertainment that they have at their disposal. Does it sound familiar? Doesn't that sound a lot like Western culture? They are us. Amos' message gets really close here. There, he's saying to his culture, his generation, you're living the high life and you're not grieved over the things that are breaking God's heart. You are rich and indulgent, but oppressing the poor and casting righteousness to the ground as you live off the fattened calf. You fail to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And you've become deaf to his voice and the warning signs that he's sending you. Now, this can happen to any of us. You turn to the New Testament and the book of James, and James speaking about the very same things to the church. So we see that these things can creep into our lives. And so it begs the question, how do we know if they have crept into our lives? How do we know if we're living in line with the Spirit and Scripture or have become complacent in our Christianity? Well, I assume that God would send us the same warning signs that he would send that generation. He would start to speak to us about these things through his word. If you have everything you need, maybe not all the things you want, but everything you need, but it's never enough, something's wrong. If you focus exclusively on your own needs and never give thought to the needs of those around you, something's wrong. If your heart doesn't break for what's happening in the world or the poor, the oppressed, or issues of justice around you, something's wrong. If you don't pay your workers or deal in your business with integrity, something's wrong. Now, when we wake up to our condition, we can return to him. Just like he references in Leviticus 26, if you listen, you can turn back to him. But in their complacency, Amos' generation wasn't even listening. Their hostility to his word is evident by their apathetic behavior displayed towards Amos' warnings. And by putting off Amos' message, they are actually bringing close a reign of terror. Look at what he says in verse 7. 
Therefore, you will be among the first to go into exile. Your feasting and lounging will end. The sovereign Lord has sworn by himself, the Lord God Almighty declares, I abhor the pride of Jacob and detest his fortresses. I will deliver up the city and everything in it. This is using some strong language. I abhor their pride. I detest their fortresses. Now, Amos was one of the last prophets in a long line of prophets sent to the northern tribes to call them back to who they were meant to be in the world. But their decadence was inoculating them from hearing his message. So that's what's happening in Amos chapter 6. We are now going to step out of Amos chapter 6 into some church history. We have covered a lot of ground the last few months if you've been here. We've covered about 1,300 years of church history, really going deep into 500 years of church history. And I actually want to do a quick review of those 500 years and all the ground we've covered because there is a pattern that I noticed the last couple weeks as I prepared for this message, and it has caught my attention. And now that I see it, I can't unsee it, so I want to talk to you about it so that you can see it and not unsee it. Make sense? Two weeks ago, we looked at the architecture of race and racism that was formed during the period of slavery. And that when slavery was outlawed, race and racism lived on. We looked at segregation and colonization, the Berlin Conference of 1884 and the scramble for Africa, and the Jim Crow laws and the segregation that was existing in America. And we looked at here in Canada, the 60s scoop, the residential school system, removing the influence of parents and culture from the First Nations. And two weeks ago, we looked at the ministry of Martin Luther King Jr. and how Amos 524 shaped the civil rights movement, how biblical justice is rooted in God's righteous moral character. Now, like in Amos, what we have observed throughout every generation of church history is that we can be lounging on our couches, thinking about our next meal, and be complacent about what is happening to others because it's working out okay for us sometimes, depending on who you are. The, the system isn't necessarily hurting me, so I have a vested interest in doing nothing about it. Even if I know it's unfair, I remain complacent because I have my fattened calves and my fine lotions to enjoy. When we are not experiencing injustice firsthand, we can become anesthetized to its impact. When I'm not personally going through something, I can be complacent to it and overlook it because the status quo is working in my favor. Now, that's just human nature, but let's remember human nature is also a fallen sinful nature. It's not the spirit of Christ. And so as believers who are filled with and led by the spirit of Christ, we are called to embody something different. Amen? When you study the Gospels, you see Jesus advancing the kingdom with compassion and justice and addressing the social sins of his day. Now, I was originally going to spend time today and go back to see how Amos chapter 6 presented itself during the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote a letter from a Birmingham jail. You can search this online. It's readily available. I would encourage you to read it. It unpacks the danger of complacency, of just being a moderate in these areas where there's gross injustice. And in that letter, he addresses the complacency of fellow clergymen who were criticizing that he was rushing too hard into issues of justice. But as I prepared for today, something else emerged that I sense is for us in our generation and for us as a church specifically. Now, again, we've covered about 500 years of church history, and I'm going to do a review of that. Now, remember when you went to school and you get a review, and then there was a test at the end? 
Like, like a test is given to you, not to teach you something, but to prove what you've already learned. So we're gonna do a review, and then I'm gonna leave you with a test at the end. We've observed this together. During the discovery of the Americas, Spain and Portugal, Spain comes over, starts to discover the Americas, and subject people to slavery. They are given papal authority to do so, the doctrine of discovery, based on the law of terra nullius. It's nobody's thing, it's nobody's land. So they start to do this. Now, Portugal comes along the western coast. Both groups are looking for more direct trade routes to India and Asia for their silks and spices. And we looked in depth at how Portugal started to build bases, strongholds, fortresses along the western coast of Africa, did some trade, but they're really trying to get to India and Asia. But eventually, the flawed theology that undergirds all of this starts to take on physical forms. We looked at Elmina Castle, a Portuguese base in West Africa, where on top of the castle, there's a church, people are singing about Jesus, teaching the Bible, but below is a dungeon through which millions of slaves pass. And we looked at how that was the largest forced migration in human history up to that point. Now eventually slavery is outlawed, but the architecture of race and racism, the social construct, forged during a time of oppression lives on. And so eventually it was against the law to take people out of Africa, so the powers that be began to colonize and take the land and remove its resources. And so what you saw was European powers, prior to the Berlin Conference of 1884, they controlled about 10% of Africa on the coast. After the Berlin Conference and its implementation, they controlled 90% of the land of Africa and started to remove its resources. And we looked at all this, and all of this resulted in a movement of wealth and resources enjoyed by a few, negatively impacting the many. And we looked at the various ways that the church was complicit through papal bulls and complacency to the suffering of others. We reviewed the teachings of Jesus and saw how this was casting righteousness to the ground and making injustice filled with bitterness. It was just like what Amos is addressing. Now, while all this was happening, God was raising up his prophets. He was sending Amos's to every generation during that period. We looked at some of them. Bartolome de las Casas was part of the Spanish conquistadors and started to fight for the rights of those who were being enslaved. Martin Luther and the other reformers who spoke against papal abuse during the Reformation. Equiano and the other abolitionists like Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, and William Wilberforce. And a couple weeks ago, we looked at Martin Luther King Jr. and the civil rights movement. And so what you notice is throughout every generation, God was sending his people to call the church back to who she was meant to be in the world. But then it dawned on me this week how it's showing up in our world today. Now, before I dive into that, I want to provide a disclaimer. During this whole series through Amos, we've had to focus on a Western, Canadian, Toronto-centric lens because we didn't have time to cover all of the global expressions. And I regret the multitude of information we haven't been able to get to. Every week, we've got pages and pages of notes that we can't get to. Because we just don't have time. We have one more message in Amos after this week. And so we've had to leave out much of the Indo-Pacific, Middle Eastern expressions of what happened during this period of human history. And it's in my heart and mind to come back and do a series focusing on that part of the world Maybe stepping into it through one of Amos' contemporaries, like Micah, because they speak about the same injustices occurring. But we had to focus in this area, and so I acknowledge that depending on your country of origin, this may not be telling your specific story or experience, but I had to speak from a Canadian Toronto Western lens because that's where our church is located. And I want to take a moment and bring to your attention 
how I'm seeing things show up in our world today. What we are seeing today is the most dramatic move of migration and displacement the world has ever known. And it dawns on me that the direction of migration flow is from places that were destabilized and oftentimes pillaged to the fortresses that profited off of them. When you study the flow of migration, the majority of it is from the global south to the global north from the very nations that experienced the destabilizing impacts of colonization, many of them trying to get into Europe and into the West. Those who have been exploited for their resources and left in nations that were destabilized by the impacts of colonization, those citizens are seeking a better way forward, a future and a hope in parts of the world, coming from parts of the world that were left untenable because of the instability left in behind. So destabilization has led to displacement. In some nations, that's economic destabilization. In other places, that's political or leadership destabilization. And as they are displaced, not because they don't love their country of origin, but rather are just seeking to carve out a future and a hope, they are moving towards the places that prospered from the destabilization that they created. And when the asylum seeker arrives on their shore, it is oftentimes met with complacency, indifference, apathy, no sense of urgency. Or worse yet, false narratives or half-truths that are full of fear and aren't fully exploring the root causes of why people are being forced to leave their country of origin in the first place. Narratives and stories that we hear on the news or in the headlines all the times. Narratives are stories that we tell ourselves that ignore the suffering of others and foster complacency or indifference. If you turn on the news, you'll hear these kinds of sound bites and political discourse. Well, they're, they're terrorists. We can't let them in. They're terrorists. They're murderers and rapists and killers. They're savages. They're, there isn't enough. They're going to take our jobs. They're going to take our homes. They are the problem. Why don't they just go back to their nation and fix what's wrong with it? Now, some of these narratives are very similar to the narratives the culture told itself during the period of colonization, slavery, and segregation. We looked at, a few hundred years ago, the narrative was, they are savages. They are uncivilized. They are violent. They are the problem. There isn't enough for everybody. People are in desperate circumstances and we don't take the time to think deeply the root causes that force them to be in that situation. But instead, we, we reach for simple soundbite narratives that leave the asylum seeker waiting in limbo. And so the refugees are sent into camps and a few months becomes a year. And a few years becomes a decade. And a few decades becomes a lifetime. All the while being told to wait patiently because we'll get to it. Now, Martin Luther King Jr. faced the same reality in his day during the civil rights movement. He was told to wait patiently for justice to arrive. And he faced criticism from fellow church leaders for his nonviolent protests. He was told that they were pursuing justice too fast and that they should allow the culture to slowly embrace change over time. And his opponents were spinning unexamined ideas and narratives 
that simply looked at the surface level stories that were being promoted throughout the media. They weren't thinking deeply about why the civil rights movement existed in the first place and what was making them even protest, nor lamenting it. And so Martin Luther King Jr. writes a letter from a Birmingham jail to his critics. And he starts to invite the church leaders to think a bit deeper. And I just want to share a few quotes from that letter. Look at what he says to them. I am sure that each of you would want to go beyond the superficial social analyst who looks merely at the effects and does not grapple with the underlying causes. So he's calling his generation, think deeper. What is going on that's causing people to protest? And then he says this, privileged groups seldom give up their privileges voluntarily. When one group is benefiting in an unequal system, what he's saying to his generation is make the system equal. The privilege you're enjoying is actually being established off the backs of oppression. And then he makes this statement. When you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. This was written in the 60s. But that principle, that truth can be applied to the refugee and asylum seeker today. And yet, here we are again. Seeing the same principles at play but it is the asylum seeker who is on the refugee highway. Not because they don't love their home country, but because of the impact of European and Western powers in the global north left their country of origin destabilized by their actions. And when they arrive, they are treated like the problem. Sering Mbay was a fisherman in Senegal. He grew up in Senegal. And he loves his nation, loves his country of origin. European boats started to show up on the western shore of Senegal and started to fish the waters. Massive boats. For years now, every year, European Union country boats have shown up in the waters and have taken away half a million tons of fish every single year. Half a million tons. The European countries do not eat the fish. They feed it to their livestock so that they become fattened calves. Amos 6 is getting real close here, isn't it? That same amount of fish could feed 33 million people in West Africa. And so Sering seeing that the fishing population has dried up, could no longer catch fish, could no longer earn a livelihood, and made the difficult but brave decision to get onto a dinghy and try and cross the Mediterranean to get into Europe. He arrived on the shores of Spain and wasn't greeted with open arms and warmly, but actually faced a lot of adversity, persecution, and racism. But he persevered through it. He eventually got established, made a life for himself, was a business owner, and was living a good life. But then he felt a call into politics. He's now an MP in Spain. And he's using his position to draw attention to the very conditions that forced him to leave his country of origin. And he appeared before the European Union, made an address to them about the overfishing of the waters, and said to them, I am not here because I didn't love my country. I am here because you created economic conditions that made life in my country untenable. He didn't want to leave Senegal. He loved it there but he was forcibly displaced by something that he didn't do. And too often, we reduce the complexity of the refugee reality to simple sound bites and political talking points that haven't been fully examined. 
When we use race or what nation you happen to be born into as a narrative that excludes you, are we not in danger of doing the same thing that previous generations did during colonization and segregation? I gotta be honest, over the last few months as we've looked at the different segments of church history, I've been kind of judgmental. I was like, man, oh, look at what they did during the discovery of the Americas. Can you believe they did that? Look at what they did during the transatlantic slave trade. How could that happen? And look at what happened during segregation, the scramble for Africa, the 60s scoop, like, like woe is them. But then the mirror was turned back towards me. And the question was asked, like, are you? Are we in danger of doing the same thing? Are we in danger of repeating the sins of the past by, by displaying complacency when there should be a sense of urgency? Because as Martin Luther King Jr. observed, justice too long delayed is justice to die. But then it dawned on me, church, we have an opportunity. We actually have a once in a lifetime opportunity. We are actually being given a moment by Jesus to join him in what he's doing in the world. Over the last few months, just as we observed, God raises up Amos's every generation throughout church history to turn the tide and speak a different truth into the culture. Through the early reformers, through the abolitionists, through the civil rights movement, could it be that we have an opportunity to join in God's redemptive movement and be like modern day Amos's. This, this is our chance to join him in his work. This is our abolitionist moment. This is our emancipation proclamation moment. This is our civil rights moment. We are being invited by God to embody something different than the cultural tide that is sweeping through our world. Now, as far as I'm aware, none of us in this room have control over the Canadian border. If you do, I'd love to talk to you after the service. But we have no control over who shows up in our city. But if you call yourself a Christian, we all have been called by God to welcome the foreigner and love the stranger who has arrived. Amen? Amen. And there is a crisis in our city. 40% of the shelter system downtown is now asylum seekers, and the shelter system is full. It is spilling over. There are people living on our streets who are refugees, who are asylum seekers. We can no longer see a global crisis in our world and then act surprised when it arrives at our doorstep. We cannot pretend that we didn't know. And when I think of the modern day refugee reality, I think of a story told by Jesus in Luke 16. He tells a story, a parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus is a poor beggar who's laid at the rich man's gate looking for mercy, and he's shown none. He's completely ignored. The rich man is complacent. Our modern refugee reality is so close to that parable. It's the only parable told by Jesus in the book of Luke that contains a name. Some believe that it might even be a real person. And so all of this begs the question, how should we live our lives? In light of this present reality, the world in which we find ourselves, what am I called to do in the midst of it? Well, I don't know if you've noticed, but I've been wearing the same shirt for this whole series. And on that shirt is a verse. It's actually from one of Amos' contemporaries. It's from the book of Micah, Micah 6, 8 when looking at the world, says to the people of God, what does God require of you? Now, I'd give you a Superman pose of the shirt, but 
I don't have a Superman bod. <laughs> what does God require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Look, I'm not trying to say that laying on your couch is a sin. Lord knows I do. I'm not saying that using fine lotions is wrong or that eating a fattened calf and a nice steak is an abomination. Drinking a bowl full of wine, that's another story. You take that up with Jesus. <laughs> God has poured out financial blessings and prosperity into many of our lives. I would consider myself rich by the standards of the world. But to simply hoard it to ourselves and be complacent towards the needs of others is too much like the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. And when I think of what Jesus calls us to do, I think of a close friend of mine. I'm going to give him a false name. His name is Joe. I think of Joe. Joe is a really, really successful businessman. He is really wealthy. And God continues to pour finances into his life. It's like he's got the spiritual gift of making money. And he lives in a really nice house, and he has a really nice cottage up north, but Joe is completely different than the average wealthy person. He is generous with everything that he owns, and he makes you feel like a treasured guest in his home, at his cottage. He's opened up his space for the foreigner, the stranger, the newcomer, people who are new to Canada. It's a, it's a party at his place, and he makes you feel so special as you enjoy it. Now, a few months ago, Joe and his wife were a part of a small team that went to Lesvos, Greece, to serve in a refugee camp. Lesvos is the main entry point into Europe along the refugee highway. It is the destination that most boats are trying to get to. And when a boat arrives, filled with asylum seekers, all hands are on deck to get people food and clothing because they show up soaked, wet, cold, and hungry from the perilous journey they've just had to make. Now, Joe and his wife were there when people arrived, and he was assigned to hand out clothing. But it's the way that he handed out clothing that caught people's attention. Joe would see people coming, and he had laid out the clothing, and, and he wanted to pick the right garment for each person, the right jacket. And so when he'd see someone who would fit something that he had, he would say, hey, over here, I got the, the perfect thing for you. Now, there were lots of people coming off the boat, and one of the workers was a little frustrated and looked at Joe and said, look, we don't have time to do it this way. There's too many people. Now, Joe's a bit of a CEO type, and, and he just speaks directly, and he looked at the person, and he said, yes, we do. Because he was treating them with dignity, as though what they picked mattered. Later in the day, after he had closed some people, he would see them in the camp, and he would say, hey, buddy, love the jacket. <laughs> and the person would stand up a bit taller, put their shoulders back, feel like they were wearing something beautiful. You see, Joe is wealthy. He's among the upper crust of society. But as he walks with Jesus, he is led to be a different kind of rich man. When he sees Lazarus laying at the gate, he doesn't ignore him, but is moved to love him. And in the process is reflecting the light and love of his Savior. Look, we don't have control over political borders. We can't solve the complexity of the world's problems. And we might feel like we're a drop in the bucket, but we can love the person in front of us, can't we? We can disrupt the narratives that we hear at parties or family gatherings. We can get educated and read a book to understand what's happening in the world and what's precipitating and causing these symptoms. We can engage our local MPs and ask what they're doing to 
deal with the challenges that we're facing? Or we can serve in ministries or support ministries that do care for the needs of refugees and asylum seekers. We operate multiple houses here at our church, the People's House. You can serve in those ministries. If you're looking for a place to start, I'd invite you to explore the International Association for Refugees. It's a ministry that we helped launch. Go to their website. They have multiple opportunities for you to get involved. Our pastor of Global Mission, our outgoing one, Sandra Ryan, she is moving over to IAFR to serve with them. So start there, check their website, they have prayer gatherings, all kinds of ways you can get engaged. In a world where complacency is so easy to slip into, we can model something different. What we can't do is be complacent. We cannot let our political leaning or our favorite podcaster or someone else inform the fullness of our response to the needs of the poor and the foreigner. We measure our response by Jesus. He is our king. He is our judge. He is the one who will inspect our lives. Not Joe Rogan or Jordan Peterson, not Justin Trudeau or Pierre Polivare or Jagmeet Singh. Jesus is our king. And in light of Amos' words... In light of Amos' words... We can't sit on our couches, put on our lotions, eat the fattened calf, and not care about the ruin of his people. Now, let me close with this final observation, and I realize I've gone way over, and I don't care. (laughs) Last Sunday... I shared with you a statue of Jesus that was made by Italian sculptor Guido Giletti in 1954. He made a statue of Jesus and buried it in the Mediterranean Ocean. And it's referred to as Christ of the Depths. One of the many tragedies over the last 10 years is the amount of people that are trying to seek asylum in Europe have to make a dangerous crossing of the Mediterranean Sea. In the last 10 years, it's estimated that about 30,000 people have lost their life at sea. Now, that's an estimate because nobody really knows the number. It's not like they're registered anywhere. Nobody knows their names. Nobody knows their ages. Nobody knows what they were trying to get away from and what they were anticipating to get to. But here's what I've been thinking about all week. At the bottom of the Mediterranean Ocean where all this is happening, Christ of the depths is there. As people are having the worst moment of their lives, Jesus is there. And he knows their name. And he knows their story. And he knows what happened in their life. And he died for each and every one of them. Why? Because he is the Christ of the depths. And this Christ who sees and knows and loves is inviting us to join him in his work of writing a better story than the one that's being written right now. We are his people who are called by his name. And we are being given an opportunity to write a new story into our world. And as we have seen over the past few months as we traverse church history, sometimes it's really hard to see what's right in front of you. But God always, always, always raises up his Amoses to speak something new into the culture around it. And so we have an opportunity, church, to join him in a new story that he's writing. This summer, some of our young adults are going to be going to serve at that camp in Lesvos for six weeks. They're going to be experiencing what Joe experienced. They're taking time from their schooling to serve Jesus in a refugee camp. 
Now, many of these young adults are going to continue their education. They're going to go on to be doctors, lawyers, engineers, school teachers, whatever. But I guarantee you, after six weeks of walking with Jesus in a refugee settlement, you're going to be a different kind of lawyer. You're going to be a different kind of doctor, engineer, school teacher. Let us not be complacent to what's happening around us. For if we are, how are we any different than the people that Amos is addressing? Let's pray. Father, in the silence of this moment, we, your church, want to listen to your voice. If there has been hostility in us towards the foreigner, the refugee that you love so dearly, forgive us, Lord. Would you lead each and every single one of us into the new thing that you want us to see, be, and do in the world? Your people are listening. Speak to us as only you can, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.